Okay, so we have, we have uh, the next uh, two presentations are um, uh, team approach. So uh, the the, uh, the first of those is going to be um, from uh, Justina Govoroska uh, and Chris Roof. And uh, Justina is a cartographer with a, a BTS, or Bureau of Transportation Statistics, at uh, USDOT. And she's joined by uh, our partner at uh, USDOT uh, from the Volpe Center, uh, Chris uh, who is an uh, update, I guess, uh, from the program. Um, so there's another um, person listed there. But Chris Roof um, is the uh, chief of the Environmental Measurement and Modeling Division at the Volpe Center. And he leads an interdisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary team of scientists, engineers, and software developers on transportation-related environmental projects. And uh, if you were in that session earlier, he mentioned his use of bike share and uh, he wanted to note that he his preferred mode is on bicycle so go ahead. so good afternoon I am Chris if you're looking at the uh, the program I'm not Megan I apologize she was unable to travel um, and she did the majority of the work on our side of this uh, so first I'd like to thank uh, everybody for having us here I'd like to thank the Bureau of Transportation Statistics for having the foresight to fund this project in the first place uh, we're going to talk about the national transportation noise map but first, it's a little after lunch. I know people might be getting a little sleepy. So by show of hands, how many people are aware of the transportation noise uh, around them in their regular environment day to day? Great. And how many of you call your Congress people? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, we won't, we, won't do, we won't go there. But so we're gonna talk about the National Transportation Noise Map. It was uh, recently released uh, by BTS and it's a, it's a pretty neat uh, tool. Uh, so just for a little background, uh, I think we all know that uh, the U.S. population is growing. It's going to be getting much bigger, looking out to uh, on the order of 2050. As the people grow, uh, people the number of people grows, uh, the demand for transportation certainly increases. And we, we, we've, been, we've carefully worded this. There will be changes in transportation noise. Um, it could be certainly growing in places, but the key is we're looking at changes over time. So uh, to inform the public and all the related stakeholders, it's, I think it's important to have a comprehensive set of noise data to inform them. And it's certainly to inform the, the policymakers, uh, the community planner, planners at all levels, but, but the public. I mean, the public gets very involved uh, with some issues around noise, whether uh, the people in this room uh, do or not. But uh, I, can, I can assure you that some Congress people get, have, are on speed dial from some of the citizens. So a quick overview. This is the first, in the US at least, the first national multimodal transportation focused noise model. Uh, BTS released it uh, several months ago. Um, it, it got, uh, it made probably surprising everybody, quite a bit of press, uh, national press across the country, which is exciting and daunting at the same time. Um, but it consists of uh, two layers at this point, airplane uh, noise and roadway traffic noise and they can be viewed uh, together or individually. And Justine is gonna show you some of the cool capabilities with that after I'm done talking. Uh, currently, it's been done for the uh, calendar year 2014, and it's an, uh, a 24-hour average, uh, 24 hour average sound level. So what you experience on average over the course of one day on a typical day for the user. Anybody recognize where this, this map is from? Yeah. Yep, great, New York City. So you see Manhattan, the sort of little peninsula in the middle, you, uh, Long Island shooting out to the right, New Jersey on the left. So <clears throat> the middle map is uh, a layer for the New York area of highway uh, and road traffic noise. Up top, you'll see the aviation contributions, and then down bottom, uh, the combination of those two. So you can look at it um, uh, as you see fit. So uh, in building up these noise data, we used uh, readily available public tools that are already used for a number of other reasons. So the FAA's Aviation Environmental Design Tool, AEDT, um, it's used uh, for regulatory planning in the US and uh, for domestic and, and international policy work uh, around the world by thousands of users. Um, and I provided the link for those interested. And then roadway noise, that's where this tool for this project um, there's the National Transportation Noise Modeling Tools built for BTS. And that merges a bunch of the data that, that are coming into the tool 
um, including the acoustics data which come from the Federal Highway Administration's traffic uh, noise model, TNM. So I provided a link <coughs> for that as well. Um, as with most of the uh, presentations here, the data uh, are really the, the key to everything um, going in. So in terms of the data sources on the aviation side, we bring in literally through the uh, enhanced traffic management system data set from the FAA, all commercial uh, aviation traffic for the U.S. national airspace for a given year. Um, it's a very large set of data and that feeds into the acoustics process. Um, people are in this room certainly uh, very familiar with HPMS. That's a, an important contributing data set uh, on the roadway side. Uh, in terms of what data were modeled on the aviation side, any airport that had at least one commercial jet departure day, uh, per day was included in that. Uh, and you'll see down below that's on the order of almost 700 uh, airports in the US. Um, on the roadway side, we modeled automobiles, medium trucks, and heavy trucks. Um, if you are an advocate for motorcycles or one who complains about motorcycles, they are not in this for, for various reasons, mostly due to data sources. We have the capability to model those, um, but for a national transportation modeling uh, exercise, they are not included. Um, there are a number of functional classes from HPMS that were modeled. I didn't put the numbers on this slide um, that feed into the data. Um, one thing that uh, needs to be kept in mind, the very first time we ran through the, the process for this uh, project, we ran everything we had. And it's great, you know, the more data the better. But then when you start to look nationally and you see that different states collect their data differently, different states sometimes interpret their data a little differently, when you looked at it at this scale, you, you would see changes in noise right at a border between states. And clearly, if there's a highway shooting across two states, um, it's probably not going to happen that way. So we made some simplifying assumptions and reduced the number of uh, classes of vehicles that were modeled. Uh, on the acoustic side, um, a, a number of meteorological data sources were used. Uh, on the aviation side, we use a, a, what are called, we bring in 30-year normals data uh, from NOAA and that gets used in the acoustics computations. TNM used some standard uh, temperature and humidity, relative humidity assumptions as well. Um, I, I, I won't go through all these assumptions, but I will say because we're trying to do this at the national scale, what we do do is make assumptions that you can make broadly across the nation and also generally ones that are conservative. And uh, as you can as expect, when, when somebody's doing a very detailed NEPA assessment of a very uh, specific geographic area, they would probably make different assumptions. Some of them the same, some of them different. And it's, it's, you need to keep that in mind when comparing you know, very specific local areas with a national scale uh, model as this. So some applications. Uh, clearly, one of the, the primary uses of this would be to be able to track trends in noise over time. Are we getting better in places, getting worse in places? Do the, do the trends in noise track intuitively with what we might expect with other transportation infrastructure investment? Um, uh, we can also do this uh, tracking trends on communities. Now, I, I will say the caveat there is, you know, certainly when you, when you see what Justina, the capability that she'll give you, is to zoom in on your backyard and find out what the noise level is in your backyard. You know, when the assumptions that are made here on a national scale, you know, you have to take that with a grain of salt. But at community level planning, certainly this can be a, a great tool to inform that process. Um, you can certainly look at multimodal effects on noise exposure. People are investing millions of dollars in one area to, for instance, put up a highway noise barrier. But if they're right next to a major commercial airport, is that the right investment? I'm, and I'm not saying that's done, but those are the kinds of things that can be you know, more clearly analyzed with a tool like this. Certainly, it can inform noise, mit noise mitigation investment uh, over time and also demonstrate the effects of noise mitigation. Now, that being said, one of the important caveats here is there are, are thousands of miles of noise barriers along highways and other roads currently in the US. Those are not accounted for in this process Currently, they certainly could be in the future, but um, at this point, uh, they're not. So I think I'll hand it over to Justina, who will show you the, the, the meat of the material. 
Um, so we already saw the noise map for New York City. And now we have uh, Washington, D.C., a, a, a zoom out of that. Um, and as you know, airports and highways are often neighbors to uh, large population centers. So we saw that in New York. We're looking um, at D.C. right now. And that's why one of the first applications for this data we thought of as the data was being developed is to uh, look at how many people were uh, potentially affected by highway and aviation noise. Um, so to get an idea of how many people could potentially be affected by aviation and highway noise, um, I worked with the raster noise data and um, a vector layer of census block groups in, that included population data. And some of you might know that working with raster and vector is a little difficult. So the first thing I had to do is convert the noise raster into a vector file in order to work with the vector file for census block groups. Um, once that was done, I intersected the two layers in ArcGIS and um, the result was a bunch of polygons that gave me an idea of what noise, what block group belonged into which noise band. Um, and then using an, a tool in ArcGIS called Tabulate Intersection, I estimated the percentage of each block group that was contained in each noise band. So we, we definitely didn't want to take the entire block group because that would skew the results. So calculated the, the percentage of each contained in each noise band. And there were a number of assumptions that um, were made in this process. Um, one of the decisions I had to make was to only use interstate noise um, for, the, for the highway layer, just purely because of the size of the data. Processing the data for all the different road classes would have just been prohibi prohibitive time-wise and, and processing um, uh, power just wasn't there within the time frame that I was working in. Uh, mm -hmm. The other assumption on the population side is that um, we assume an even distribution of population across the block group. And you probably know that already. That's hardly ever the case. Um, block groups are statistical units, not even administrative units. So they really, um, they hardly ever have an even distribution of population across them. And another um, assumption, or I, I guess I'm calling it an assumption, is I ignored the margins of error that ACS data provides for population counts at the block group level. Um, margins of error increase as the geography gets smaller. Block groups are not the smallest geography. They're the second smallest. And total population is a little more immune to, to large margins of error, but they're still there, and they definitely have an impact on um, how accurate um, those data are. So once I had the percentage of block group within each noise band, I was then able to calculate uh, the percentage of the population of each of those block group chunks that belonged in each noise band and was able to develop this table. Um, and I wasn't comfortable providing the raw data, so the population count that fell into each noise band. That's why I decided to go with the percent of total population that fell into each noise band. And as you can see, majority of the population, roughly 98%, uh, is potentially exposed to noise levels of between 35 and 50 decibels over a 24-hour time period, and that's comparable to the sound of a humming refrigerator. Only very small percentages of population experience higher noise levels. Um, in addition to looking at the population uh, that was affected by noise map, we also wanted to look at the data and um, give the users the ability to sort of look in their backyard, as Chris mentioned. Uh, we did restrict it a little bit, so I'm going to quickly switch to a live demo, and we know how that works. So um, we, we have three web mapping applications. Um, one is for just road noise. The other one is just for aviation noise. And then there's an app that combines both highway and aviation noise, and that's the one I'm going to look at. So when you open it, um, Majority of the map is yellow because that's the lowest noise band. And there's a legend right here, just to give you an idea of, of what's going on. 
And we did restrict um, your ability to zoom to a certain extent. Just to show you something different, I'm gonna focus on Denver. So you can pan around the map and zoom and pretty immediately you can start seeing the footprints of runways and airports. Uh, and you can see the highway noise as well. Uh, I forget what scale we stopped at, but um, or maybe we did it. Nope, this is it. So you can't zoom any closer, but I would say that's pretty close enough. You can see the base map underneath. Um, so you can't look at your specific street, but you get pretty close. Um, I think Chris talked about this, that, you know, this is an average, it's, it's a national level model, it's not necessarily intended to inform local area um, noise levels. So whatever you see here, take it with a grain of salt, given all the assumptions we've just given you. But this is, this is one of the three applications that we developed that allow you to explore what's happening in your area. And that's all I have for you.